Blessings, guys. Before we get started, there's a uh, we have a new format with the uh, prayer thing in the back. So if you have a prayer request, just write it down, and then uh, we will be doing that for our prayer format. We're going to try that, and then uh, if that doesn't work out, we'll go back to the way we were doing it. All right. Thank you, guys. start with some worship. Hope everybody is having a terrific day, and let's pray together. So Lord, we just offer ourselves to you in worship. We have faith that greater things than even what Jesus did, we get to experience.
searching. If you're searching for our heart, is your reward. We, we are yours. We want to be the want to be the oil. We want to be the sacrifice.
welcome into this place, Lord. Welcome into this atmosphere. Welcome into this city, God. Welcome into these communities, these streets, these schools. Welcome into our communities, into our families, into our government. Welcome, Lord, into our problems. Welcome, Lord, into our situations. Welcome, Lord, into our worlds, private that we've hidden from you and that we haven't let you take care of, God. Welcome. Welcome, God. Welcome into our, our minds to transform it. Welcome into our words.
praise. If you have your prayer language, sing in the spirit. God's doing something. miracles in the Augusta area. The CSRA belongs to Jesus Christ. Wonder-working God of miracles. Whatever. 
whatever you need him for, he's here tonight. You need a miracle, he works miracles. You need healing in your body, he heals. you and you alone, God. There's no one higher, no one greater, no one even comes close. Yours is the victory. You are victorious. My banner, my righteousness, there is no righteousness without God. call this out of order. Let the religious spirits talk. They have no power. Let them talk. They said our God cast out demons by the power of Beelzebub when they were the ones operating under that. It's time to get real. No more fake, phony play acting. It never was good enough for God. Never was. We were fooling ourselves. I'm talking to me. God, I repent for any religiosity found in me. Any iniquity found in me. Any sin found in me. God, I repent right now. I can't speak for any of you. The Lord is walking around this room. If you don't feel his presence, something's wrong. Thank you, Jesus. Where is the Lord God of Elijah, of Moses? The God of the universe stepped down from heaven not just to bear our sins. He did that, but not just to do that. He is our Savior, but He's also our Lord and our King. There's a work to be done. God, get us ready. Yeah. Move us out yeah, of the way, God. God. If you need healing, just raise your hands. Nobody has to lay hands. I believe in that. But the God of heaven is here. Just receive the healing. Just receive it. Whatever your need is, he can meet it. Finances, he's got you. He's got you. I'm not preaching prosperity, but God prospers us for his kingdom. How can we advance the kingdom if we're broke? I'm not talking about buying a mansion in Mercedes here. I'm talking about forwarding the kingdom of God. It's time to move. There's no more waiting. God's waiting on us. step. God, get us ready for the persecution that follows. 
when we start operating like we should, there will be persecution. I'm not talking about he said, she said persecution. I'm talking about locked up in prison, thrown behind bars. If the devil tries to lock me up, he just messed up because he gave me a prison ministry. What can he do to me? What can he do to us? He can't do anything. If he kills us, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord Jesus. Bring it on. We exalt thee. Let's let's hit another round of that. Now, woo! We exalt thee. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. Oh, oh, Pastor Kyle, can you join me up here, please? The Lord's telling us to lay hands, well, telling me to lay, we're going to lay hands on people. Whoever wants it. There's a greater anointing, church. There's a greater anointing. This was not planned. We got anointing oil. Who wants more of God? Who wants more of God? Come on up. Come on up.
of that was planned. All right. Hallelujah. Our first speaker, I'm going to introduce uh, Matt Jones. If you want to run up to the front. Hallelujah. Run, don't walk. Hallelujah. While you're making your way up here. I've known Matt for, what, about five years, four and a half, five years? I've seen the Lord do incredible things. He's using Matt. He's using him. He's got a powerful testimony. Y'all give it up for Matt. So I grew up with two addicts and alcoholics, man, you know, and I saw them doing what they were doing, and I wanted to do what they were doing, you know, I wanted to, I used to steal weed from my dad and smoke it at the bus stop before school, you know, I don't know, but uh, that escalated into me trying to sell drugs, and that didn't work out too good, um, and I ended up moving out, and um, I got an apartment with two girls, I thought I was a man, but I really Things. Anyways, God interceded. He tried to intercede a couple times, man, but I was too blind to see it. Um, and I, um, I caught some felony drug charges, and I went to prison for give me a six-year sentence, and I did. Uh, I, put, I went to boot camp, and I turned the boot camp, the 90 days, of the really gravy, you know, like 90 days, and then go home. I ended up turning that into uh, a couple of years and 44 months of in and out, in and out, in and out. So I turned 90 days into a 44 months straight of in prison, out of prison, in prison, out of prison. I got out of prison for about six months and go back because I would say, hey, you know what? I figured out a different way to do this. You know, I can do drugs and parole at the same time. That didn't work. You know, and they'd send me back and get out again, I tried again, I did it again, and I got out, and they finally just told me to max my sentence out. So I went and did that, and um, then I got out, and um, was still hanging out in South Augusta with some crazy folks, and um, I got introduced to uh, needles. And needles, just hit me down through there, man, you know. I had hepatitis C, but I got that cured because because of Dee, bro, you crazy. He, I got all that, man, you know, and finally it took me having to get into a wreck, you know, because I was running crazy. I was just heading back in that same direction and going back to prison. I was gonna, I was doing that. I had 13 and a half on my wrist because that means 12 jurors, one judge, and a half, and a half chance of going home, right? And um, I was living that whole crazy lifestyle, and um, finally, God interceded, and got, I got into a wreck, which was the best thing that ever happened to me, man, you know, like, that was the best thing, and today, um, you know, I have, a, I say this at Walmart all the time, I work at Walmart, I'm a greeter at Walmart in the garden center at Grove Town, right, but I get to tell people about Jesus all day, right, you know, when they ask me how I'm doing, Hey, hey, how are you doing? They tell me, and then they come back with, that, "How are you doing?" I say, "Hey, man, you know I'm doing good, better than I used to be, right?" And I just give them the whole thing of how Jesus, 
I've been sober going on five years in June. And um, today, life is great, man. But the most important thing I got out of the wreck was a relationship with Jesus Christ again. And um, I'm grateful for the things that I went through. I'm grateful for everything that I had to do. And um, I don't know, man. You know, today, life's good, man. I, I don't have any regrets of anything that I did. most important thing, see, see, I started, I was sharing meetings at the AA Clubhouse on Sundays, but God took me out of that. You know, I was going to do that for a little while, but God made, made it happen to where they, they, they fired me. They fired me, right, on Sunday night, so I could come back to the War Eagles ministry, because I've been going to this for a couple of years, and um, it's, it's grown, and um, I don't know, man. I just feel like that was all right. Look, thank you. I'm, that's, that's all I got. Yeah. Hallelujah. All right. I didn't write out our speakers. Uh, I think I asked Miss Vivian, did I ask you to be second? I think so. Do you mind coming up? Hold your applause, hold your applause. Wait until she gets here. <laughs> All right, now give it up. Yeah. Miss Vivian. Um, Check, check, check. All right, well, um, Matt, that's an awesome testimony. It's great to hear you, you know, break the ice here, too. <laughs> this is my first time um, ever having giving my testimony, so I'm a little nervous. I wrote everything down, y'all, so if you see me looking down, it's because I'm reading it. I'm going to kind of stay on script because uh, those who know me know that I can, you know, but if the spirit leads me otherwise, then of course we'll go with that, okay? Um, so my name is Vivian, and um, I'm here to share a little bit about myself. I'm a mother of six. The three young people that you saw up here coming to um, get prayer, that was completely unscripted. Um, they say you lead your children onto God and let him do the rest. Um, hanging on to the promises that he's made that when you train up the children as the, in the way they should go, you know, when they grow, they will not depart. And so sometimes as parents, we have to kind of, you know, lean on God on those times where it looks like the world's trying to take them away from us, okay? So um, I was introduced to the gospel by my mother, who was also our Sunday school teacher, okay? One thing about my mom, she will always tell us, you don't play with God, okay? So that was like ingrained in my brain. So I thought I never would um, see... In my lifetime, I grew up, you know, again, my mom is being my Sunday school teacher, but still, uh, in my head, I'm like, okay, that's, you know, something for old folks, you know, and Jesus, you know, it, they've been saying Jesus is coming back for umpteen years, you know, so I, I was kind of in the back of my head, but I never thought that I would see, you know, things come to pass in my generation. So, um, in my young life, I believed that I could live my life like I wanted to. So as long as I will repent from my sins with the letter, very last breath, okay, this is how the enemy lies to us, thinking that, okay, well, sure, as long as you say the, the sinner's prayer, you know, you're good, okay? So I live with that um, my young adult life. Um, I lived a very reckless life. Um, anytime you're li living outside of Christ, your life is reckless, okay? There's nothing good that can come out of that. So, but still, in my head, I'm thinking, you know, before I get into deep trouble, you know, I'll ask God to forgive me of my sins and take my last breath and, and go, because that was my train of thought, you know. I'm so glad God had mercy on me and had plucked me out before I even knew I was plucked out, okay? 
So as I grew older and going through many trials in which I had to call on the name of Jesus for help, okay, another thing that God did for me is as a little girl, he put the song in my heart, I would lift up my eyes onto the hills. I memorized that song even before I can read, okay? So this is how I, I tell everyone, you know, God will always give you a solution before a problem even arises. So my confession as a little girl was I would lift up my eyes onto the hills. So growing up, knowing that, okay, Jesus is, you know, you just call on Jesus, you ask him to forgive you of your sins, you're good, you know, when you're in trouble, you call on God, still living a reckless life, okay? So I knew the importance of teaching my children, okay, about God and salvation to, through Christ. So as I continue to be on again and off again, love affair with God, okay, my frustrations in marriage, um, that, by the way, I knew I had, I had never, you know, we don't think to ask God to order our steps in every single way. But God's grace even teaches us about those things to make sure that we come to God about every decision that we make. We don't think twice, you know, who we date or who we marry. You know, I know I did, and I'm speaking for myself, y'all, okay? Um, never thought to ask God about who should I marry, okay? Anyhow, and my frustrations in marriage, um, that, by the way, I never asked God. Um, I continue to make many errors and thus compiling more traumas in my life outside of God. God became my go-to <laughs> only in times of trouble. The rest of the times, I lived my life as I saw fit, okay? However, in 2018, I came across a supernatural experience that changed my life, and we all know that just as Paul on his way to Damascus had that encounter with God, where you, we, each of us have that definite before I knew God and after we came to, a, a, now knowing him, okay, it's not just knowing his name, because again, I was taught that since I was a little girl, but having an intimate relationship with God, just like Adam didn't know Eve until they actually had an intimacy, this is what I'm saying. This was my experience, okay? So, um, again, this was at a time where I really needed God's help once again, but this time was different. I recognized that there was a pattern to my suffering, okay? And in the midst of a pain so grieving to my soul that um, the implications of this, this error of my ways was having on my children. Like when you see that there's a pattern going on in your life that keeps kind of repeating itself, you know, and God it, like quickens you, okay, wait a minute. I've seen this before too many times, okay? And, and God was teaching me about breaking generational curses. But what hurt me more was what this effect of this family dysfunction of this generational curse was doing to my children. Okay, because I can deal with what's going on with me, but when you know that it's affecting your children, okay, that's a whole different, you know, story. So um, I was confronted with some so sobering thoughts that they too will need to heal from repeated mom and dad dysfunctions, and I cried out to God like I never have before. I was broken and completely depleted of life of joy, of peace, and my soul was grieved as if someone had, had died. Like, I, I, I went to a place to where I was so grieved in my soul that it was worse than, than even when my, my, my mom passed away. I mean, this grieving of my soul was even stronger than that, okay? Um, that was someone that, um, that was the old me. I was dying and in darkness, and I was, it, it was, it was, the darkness was so overwhelming that it was taking over me. Um, and I asked God to show me what I needed to see about why I was re repeating these toxic cycles um, in the same way that I saw it happen with my mom and my dad. Like, you, I started to take notice that 
the same thing that had happened with my mom and dad with you know alcoholism and you know um, domestic violence and you know sexual abuse and you know I started seeing that repeat itself in my life and when I turned around and saw how it was affecting my children that was the sobering moment for me so I immediately asked um, the question um, to God and I said why am I repeating these cycles I mean I'd never thought to even ask God that before in my life I didn't know how to you know, I've heard about generation, but even in my mind, that wasn't even nowhere in my radar. I didn't know what generational curses were, okay? <clears throat> so he showed me the lie that I was repeating. God is so awesome. He will always take you back to where the lie was planted, okay? Now, he imparts the truth. It's up to us to receive the truth, okay? So I lay for days in meditation and prayer and in that same uh, roundabout of, of days, I, I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which again was an experience that I, it, you, I can't describe what that was like. But I knew that something had happened to me that had never happened before, and it like, the only way I can, I can ex explain it is a light comes on. And all of a sudden, God's truth start becoming real to you, okay? So I, became, I began um, my journey with God as the Holy Spirit continued to teach me. He was teaching me so much. I have notebooks, y'all, okay? I like to write, but I also like to learn. So I have notebooks of stuff as God was teaching me um, that, that I recorded, okay? So... These were the early signs that um, God had marked me and sealed me for his purpose. Okay, so I began to give others um, words. Just like, it, it's, you know, God doesn't care about titles, what title you have. And I know a lot of people's prophets is this. And, and when God gives you a word for a, a person that's in front of you, and if your heart, first of all, your heart has to be set on fire for God first. Yes. And you have to make sure that you hear what he's saying to you yes. before you can speak to anybody else. Right. Before you can open your mouth, okay, because cast, you know, first you gotta see the speck in your own eye. Because yes. with, with that, you can't see clearly what he's doing to somebody else, okay? Um, so there was also um, evident opposition <laughs> to those Y'all, I've been ostracized by, you know, family members, um, coworkers. I mean, people who started thinking that I'm crazy because I used to be like this, and now I'm like this. Yeah. So anytime you do a turnaround, it's so radical, okay? And I'm not talking about doing it mechanically. When God starts changing who you are, he starts changing your whole DNA. Who you used to be does, looks nothing like who you, who you become in Christ, okay? Now, your outer appearance may still look the same, but even that through time, he changes, okay? So there was, um, I, had to, I had to understand that they weren't opposing me. I never saw it as, why don't they like me anymore? I never felt embraced by the world to begin with. I was trying to be with, like the world, but the world knew I was in like the world, so they still, even while I was in the world, I was being casted out, okay? So when we carry God's light um, and his favor is on our lives, okay, we become the Josephs. I'm sorry, am I up? <laughs> okay, so we become like Josephs. We go through, through the, the pit, okay, and God checks our attitude while we're there. Even there... He will raise us up, okay? But it's not for our own raising us up, but because those that come behind you, okay, are the ones that you're going to lead to Christ by your own light, by, by what ha God has done in your life, okay? So real quick, the last thing I want to say is that, and this is the most important part, y'all. I gave you a little bit of who I am, but this is my testimony, okay? Um, 
even with that, we start feeling good about what God is doing in our lives, how he's using us, how he's um, leading us, the understanding, and we get high and mighty in our own eyes. Okay? So when God said to me, do not be wise in your own eyes, let me tell you this. I thought I was good with God. Okay? Even in my weaknesses and my pride, I continue my secret sin, okay? Because I believe that, well, God knows my heart like we all do, okay? He, he knows. He, he's still using me, okay? And slowly losing ground in the spirit, okay? Because of my passivity with my own sin, okay? But God and his ever kind love towards me brought this scripture to me. And that's found in James 1, um, verse 12. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials, because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has prepared for those who love him. And out of that, okay, what stood out was he didn't prepare the crown of life to those whom he loved. He prepared the crown of life to those who love him. And those who love him keep his commandments. If you don't keep his commandments, do you love him? Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Okay? If we love him, feed the sheep. Okay? Keep his commandments. By this shall all men know that you are disciples of God, by the way you love one another. You know? So that's what he brought to me. It's not to those whom he loved. Is if you love me, you keep my commandments. So lastly... And um, the, the last verse that he gave me was Acts 20, 32, and says, And now I commend, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Okay, so the crown that we receive of life is not just for because he loves us, it's because of we love him. So if we love him, we keep his commandments, we love him, we make sure that we check ourselves and not deceive ourselves because we are in those times that even the very elect can be deceived. Okay. I didn't know you were a preacher. All right, next we got Miss Carla. Come on up. Powerful testimony, powerful testimony. You ready? You still drunk from the Holy Ghost? Yeah, I am. Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I really don't know where to start besides we serve an awesome God. Um, I was been praying last night and today. Left church early, went home and started praying and like. I'm just going to leave what I got to go down. So if I don't, I'm just going to go way off. So I'm going to read it best of my ability. Before I do that, the people that know me know I couldn't be that great. Um, going to church with Jeremy and them, and my reading just progressed, got better and got better. And it's done got super better. So I praise God for that, because it, if it wasn't for him, I would not be reading good as I'm reading. But I'm going to go ahead and read it. The Lord gave me some words on here. Um, but it says, I know I was going to Damascus, which was a church that I went to before I went to the Word of Life. It says, I got... Um, Um, and God told me he wants me to go to go on a mission trip so uh, I sent to go to Word of Life he told me to go to Word of Life the Lord actually spoke to me and said go to Word of Life church in 2021 and I Ooh. 
save myself and go with him on a journey with you. I know when you tell me to go, I will go. When I was a little girl, I grew up in a church, and my mama had me there Wednesday and Sunday in VBS. And I was up in church. I grew up in church pretty much my whole life since I was an infant. My mom and dad had me in there. And it says, raise your child up the way they should go, and they child not depart. You may stray away. You might get away from God. But he's going to pull you right back in. And uh, so I had some mentors at Damascus with Jane and Susan, Christy for Word of God is my sword. The Lord gave me that sitting in Word of Life parking lot. I felt like I am wrapped up in the Word of God. And to be wrapped up in the Word of God is so awesome. I wouldn't take it no other way. And I'm leaving next year, July, and going on another mission trip. But I guess I'll say all that to say this, that I've had a hard life. But my mom, she made sure I was in church. And I thank her for that every day. When my mom passed away in the house, I seen angel wings fly off. And that's the best sight I've ever seen in my entire life. Lord, let me see that for a reason. And I thank him for that. And I thank Jeremy when they were going to Word of Life to let me read as much as I did because it said, read out loud. And you'll just keep learning. So, and I thank I thank them for that. And uh, I love you, Jeremy. God is good. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we, let's just take a minute and just thank you, Lord. Whew. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. There's power in the testimonies. Man, the anointing's strong up here. I'm like getting drunk just standing here. <laughs> Whoo! Okay. In the spirit, we're online. Thank you, Lord. Got to make sure. Be very clear. That's I'm drunk in the spirit. All right. Our next speaker is Miss. Is it Jackie? Miss Jackie? Come on up. I gotta warn you. It's there's some there's something happening up here. Hallelujah. Let's give it up for Miss Jackie. Hi. I got a word for you back there. God's not finished with you. Keep the faith and keep believing. Because the devil is a liar. And he will restore you 100%. I stand on it. And when two or three are gathered together, and we agree, he's present here tonight. I feel it. I feel it. Okay. My name is Jackie. I'm shaking like a leaf up here. <clears throat> okay. I am a multi-miracle walking woman. Okay. I was raised in church also by my mother, Pentecostal. And 
had an alcoholic father who ran around and beat on my mother. So my childhood was not the best. Um, I went through a thing where if God was so real, why does he let this stuff happen? Okay. <clears throat> anyway, I give my heart to the Lord, finally. And I say finally, because the first time I done it, it was verbal, but it wasn't in the heart. And when I came to the Lord the right way, and when they brought me up out of the water baptism, I started speaking in tongues. Yes, he's real. But my main thing I wanted to let you know is our God is still in the healing business. Okay. In 2007, I was working as a hospice nurse with death and dying. Knew a lot about the medical as an RN. I was diagnosed with end stage liver disease. And at that time, stage four, when they told me stage four, I thought cancer, but it wasn't. It was liver disease. Never drank, never smoked, never done drugs. I said, how can my liver be dead? I only had 20% of my liver functioning. Medication that I was on ate my liver. Unfortunately, we're from Michigan, okay? Originally, he was in the military. Um, the doctor I had, and shame on me as a nurse, because I know better, never did labs on me. And the medication became toxic, and it ate my liver. So, um, which caused me to have cirrhosis. And a lot of people say, cirrhosis, oh, you're an alcoholic. Never done it. But I know. So 2007, when I was diagnosed, I got a closer walk with the Lord. I knew from my experiences as a nurse, seeing the death and dying, sounds crazy, but I'm gonna tell you, when you've got someone who knows the Lord and they pass, you know it. You can see it in their face. When they don't, they fight. They're scared, right? It is true. It's, you know, I wasn't afraid of death. At that time, they told me I had two years of life. With the transplant, five years. Okay, they don't know my God, okay? They don't know my God. So when that two years is up, and I'm still not going to the top of the list because they go by how sick you are, I kept getting better. But then I would bottom out again. So this up and down of the list um, was discouraging. And I couldn't understand, why, Lord, are you doing this to me? You know, I read my Bible. I prayed. I did everything I was supposed to be doing, working my way. You can't work your way. Yeah. Working my way. And I just felt like I was being attacked by the Lord. Why, I didn't know. So two years come. I'm still going. It took five years for me to get my lever. Okay. You know, God has a way of doing things to bring glory to himself through me. Okay. And what happened was I was trying to find my liver. I wasn't putting it in God's hands. I wasn't letting him do it. January the 31st of 2016, we got a phone call. We went to Atlanta. That's where it's at. Went up there, went through all the needlework, all the testing, ready to go on the table. And the surgeon comes in. He said, I'm sorry. I'm not putting this liver in you. The liver was junk. It looked good on paper, but it was junk. That was just like my breaking point. You know, Lord, why do you want me to die? Why do you want me to die? You know, I had the doctors there saying, we want you to see a psychiatrist because 
I wasn't showing fear. And I kept telling them, I'm in a win-win situation, guys. If I die, I'm going to heaven. If I get a new liver, I move on. They don't like that. Doctors don't want to hear the truth. Well, most doctors don't. There is some that do. I had great transplant surgeons that do believe in Christ. Um, but that was the 31st of January. That was the breaking point, but it's what I needed. Because that night, I collapsed on the floor before the Lord. And I said, it's in your hands, Lord. I give up. If you want me to have a liver, you'll give me one. If not, I'm coming home. Bawled my eyes out, screamed, bawled, you know, but I give it to the Lord. And that's what I needed to do, was give it to him. Okay, so I felt great. I felt like I was being healed afterwards. I had a peace, a joy. It's just the, a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I felt so healthy. Went to Atlanta for every month I had to go do blood work. Depending on how sick you are and what your numbers look like, you go up and down this list. On the 5th of April, I went for my monthly. They took my blood work. Normally they say, oh, we'll call you and go on home, right? Two and a half hour drive from Atlanta, go home. We said, no, we're scanned. I'll wait for my result. And so I went into the doctors and she come in and she said, we have to admit you. I said, for what? <laughs> you know, um, because I felt great. She said, you're in kidney failure. I said, no, I don't think so. I pottied this morning. <laughs> I mean, I'm being honest. And she said, no, we tested you a couple times and you had kidney failure, which puts you to the top of the list. There's three ways to get to the top of the list is kidney failure, actively dying, very close, and cancer of the liver. So because of kidney failure, I'm the next one to get one. So they admit me to an emergency room and a gentleman come in and he whispered to me, my, my donor was, I hate the word harvest, at Emory and brought across the street to me to Piedmont, um, comes in and said, we've got a healthy pink little liver for you. And I said, yeah, okay. You know, so I go to my room, go through all the tests and everything, and I'm going on the table. I had, my husband here said, can we have a word of prayer before I go in? There was eight doctors and nurses around my bed. He was praying. I opened my eyes and their heads were all bowed and their eyes were closed, praying with me. And I knew then I had nothing to fear. Jesus has me. So Anyway, so eight and a half hours later, I get my new liver on my donors from Atlanta. Um, approximately 33 years old gentleman. Um, he gave me his liver and it's doing wonderful. It's doing beautiful. But um, what I wanted to share was God give me my liver. There is not a doubt in my mind that God give me this liver. Okay, because the next day they come in to do dialysis on me. I said, there's nothing wrong with your kidneys. What happened that kidney failure? The doctors don't know. They said, we tested, we know. I said, you don't know my God. You don't know my God. Well, along with that, my physician come in snickering comes in and he says, you tickled me. He said, he had you strapped down with your arms out. He said, and you looked up and you said, come on, Jesus. And I took this hand, I'm giving you so much to about, this hand, and I grabbed a hold of the hand of Jesus. And he went through surgery with me, holding on to his hand. Okay? 
there to this day, I've celebrated six years with my new liver. So I've went beyond the five years. According to the doctors, I can easily see 20 because I'm doing so good. Um, the Lord has just continually, continually blessed me. But you know, Satan keeps trying us. Keeps trying us. Six months after my liver transplant, I had back surgery at one of the local hospitals. Instead of the surgeon do it, he let the residents do it. He was in the room, but they cut my L5 and S1 nerve in my spine. I walked into surgery, come out in a wheelchair, said, they told me, you will never walk again. We're sorry, the nerves will not regenerate in your lifetime. You will not walk. I said, you don't know my God. Amen. You don't know my God. It took me two years to get out of the wheelchair and up walking, and you see me walk up here. My balance, I'm still working on it. I have no feeling in either leg from my knees to my toes are totally numb. And I tell them that, and they don't believe. They stick needles and everything, and they go for it. They've operated on my foot. Go for it. I don't feel nothing, but I'm walking. So I went back to this doctor who said I'd never walk again. And he looked at me. He said, oh, you're walking. And I said, yeah. He said, what happened? I said, I got a new doctor. And they said, oh, yeah, who's your new doctor? And I said, Jesus Christ. <laughs> they had the gall to look at me and say, oh, you're one of those. I said, you're right, I am one of those, but one of those is walking. I came up this flight of stairs. I came up this flight of stairs today, scaring him to death, right? Because supposedly I can't do that. Now I will go down the elevator because I know <laughs> I'm going down them stairs. I will, you know, because even at home I have to go sideways. But the Lord's not done with me. Amen. I believe that I will get full restoration Amen. of my walking in my balance. He's my healing king. Um, <laughs> but he still heals. Amen. He still heals. Now I'm going to share one little other thing. I am covered in the blood of Jesus. Amen. And there's not a doubt in my mind. I have had people with COVID all around me and including my husband, living with somebody with COVID. One of the things after your transplant, you're on anti-rejection drugs for life. You have no immunities. I've done the two vaccines. My anti-rejection drugs killed the vaccine. Okay, it's doing its job. Everybody around me with COVID, I'm covered in the blood. I have not gotten COVID. I have not been sick. Some buddies don't have no immunities. I got Jesus. You know, so I just want to say that he continues to heal me. I've asked him why I don't deserve all this. I don't feel worthy. I don't feel worthy. And I kept asking in prayer, Lord, why did you let my brother with cancer at 36 die? But you keep healing me. Why? You know, why do you let my parents die? But you kept healing me. And I heard him loud and clear. I'm telling you, if you listen, he talks to you. Okay? Because exactly what I'm doing tonight, the testimony. He's given me testimony after testimony, and I'll keep sharing. I laughed at you when you talked about Walmarts. I can go with the cashier or the dressing room or whatever. No, how are you today? Let me tell you. You know, I had liver transplant, and they hear my testimony. They can walk away if they want, but they'll listen. But yeah, that's why I started stickering. You said, you know, I just tell them. Don't ask me how I'm doing, because I'll tell you. But. Anyway, thank you for the opportunity.
keep believing, keep believing. And is that your mother back there? Yes. I did tell her. Got answers, honey. You got answers. But I didn't know that was your mother there. Is that okay? <laughs> Glory to God. And next is my mother. Let me tell you a little bit about my mother. I've known her my whole life. Now you can make your way up here. Just make your way slow so I can talk. I've known her my whole life, not her whole life. She's my mom. She's uh, not a natural blonde. Come on, keep, keep walking. <laughs> I did say take my time. Take her time. All right, let's give it up for uh, Miss Ginny Whaley. hard to talk when you've been crying the whole night. Good grief. Um, I've brought some papers to give out, and I won't blame my husband. He was helping me um, print them, but two of them are backwards. First Peter 2.24 and Isaiah 53.5. Um, the scripture says under them you'll have to put them in the right place because it printed backwards. So it's just going to make it be a word game for you to put them in the right place, okay? So there you are. <laughs> That's right. So, uh, just a real quick, because Jeremy's watch is going to go off before I'm done. I just know it. So, there you are. So, just a bit about Charles and me. He, he grew up Catholic. I grew up Methodist. My parents, though, they, his parents and my, and my parents both had us in church our whole life. And um, I love the Lord the best I knew how. You know what I mean? Yeah, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Um, but when I was a teenager, a group came through and really talked about loving the Lord. And I gave my heart to the Lord then. And it was like, when, once you really give your heart to the Lord, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. You open your Bible and you went, who changed the words? Y'all know what I'm talking about? It's like you open it up and go, huh, somebody got a hold of my Bible and it is kind of interesting now. Do y'all know what I mean? And so I started reading it. It was like, this is cool. This is interesting. But, um, but I don't go, it's just, I don't want, there's some nice people at church. Do y'all know what I'm talking about? But I didn't know how to have power to walk it out and be successful in my walk. There's temptations along the way. And until you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you're a teenager, there's temptations. Do y'all know what I mean? And so Charles and I got married, and that was an interesting marriage because we had a Catholic priest and a Methodist preacher at our wedding. And then when we, when we were in our, um, anyway, in the late 80s, we received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that was awesome. Because at that time, we lost most of our friends. Because every time they got with us, we went, let me tell you something. And they were like, woo who are y'all? Because we were still in the Methodist church where I grew up, and we about ran, they about ran us out. But you know what? We went off to Bible school, and we found out, <laughs> we saw some stuff, because it was, it was up in Tennessee. Some of y'all might have heard of Norval Hayes, but it was, we saw legs grow out. We saw people get slain in the spirit. We saw healings. We saw all kinds of stuff. And when we came home from school, we, our boys were little, we came home and we were a little bit disappointed because, I mean, some of our friends are spirit-filled, but some of the churches we went to weren't real excited to hear what we had to say. And that kind of blew us out of the water. But, you know, but our friends that had received the baptism of the Holy Spirit were, were you know, but then some of them went off to school and left us and we didn't have a whole lot of people to talk to. <laughs> But we had been called to children's ministry, and so we were excited about that. But what I have found over the years is if you don't hook up with people with the right mind, same mindset as you, 
some of it will start sliding. Even if you're getting in the word yourself, you'll start gradually losing some of that. You've got to stay with like-minded people. You know what I mean? And so, anyway, just to keep going a bit, um, over the years, I started having some symptoms, it sounds like some of, some of y'all, and I'd say about 17, 18 years ago, I started having some real funky health stuff going on. And, um, you know, people prayed for me and all, but, but um, it was thyroid and, and um, just different things. And gallbladder working at 7%. I mean, I was having a bunch of stuff. And then they found out I had a very irregular heartbeat. I mean, if, and I'm not saying, I, I just want y'all to hear me because I'm not going to open the door to the enemy to start trying to put some of this stuff, craziness, happening again, okay? So I'm not, I just want to tell you what was happening then, okay? So um, anyway, they started, they told me that because they had to do a heart cath, they, they had to do all kinds of tests on me got some people in here know what I'm talking about all right and so nothing against the medical community because if it wasn't for them I wouldn't have some of my family in the room all right and so and I do take medicine but God has has touched my body okay and so just letting you know um, any sudden things would set my heart off and I could tell the doctor about it, but he never saw it happen. So it's one thing to tell him about it and another thing for them to see it. But one day, I was going down one way to my doctor's appointment, and an ambulance got right behind me. And they decided they need to turn their siren on. And when they did, my heart went, how about that? And when it would, it, I have to act it out, y'all. It's just... When you have three sons and now 11 grandchildren, you act out your stories, okay? And so when it would happen, it would, bless you, it would, it would go, it would, I can't describe it except to say that when it would get off rhythm, it would go, it would feel like, and then it would go, bam, and it felt like somebody literally squeezing my heart hard. And it says that I fell. That's how hard I act out my stories. I did not, okay? And so it would, it would be like somebody squeezing my heart, and it would hurt. And I would go, thank you, ambulance. And so I had to go and park my car and walk in, and every few minutes I'm doing this wonder. They didn't say, what's wrong with you? You're having a spaz attack. And so I got into the doctor's office, and he looked at me, and I said, it's happening right now. He said, go get on the treadmill. And they hooked me up. And the nurse was standing right there, and I saw it. Because on the thing, it would go, and it looked like a splat, like a, a bird had splatted. And I'd go, ah. And she went, ooh. That helps you feel real good, you know? And so the doctor came in, and she's going, ooh, and I'm going, ah. You know? And he turned it so I couldn't see it, because I think he thought I was reacting to the splat. And, and he moved her back so I couldn't see her face. And then I kept going, ooh. And evidently, it was still timing to when it happened. And he looked at me, and he said, get off the treadmill. And I said, okay, and I'm still going. And he says, you are a rare bird. And I said, why? And he says, most people don't feel those. And I said, great. And the whole time I'm doing like this, and he said, people aren't supposed to feel that. And I'm going, I do. And so he had to give me medication so that whenever it would happen, I could take it to stop it. Because I was already on medication to keep it from happening. But now I have to be on medication to keep it from, make it stop when it happens. And so Charles used to think it was funny that when we, I'd go to the mailbox, if I crossed it from the car, he'd blow the horn. You know how people do stuff like that? And it would make it happen. And then he had to quit doing stuff like that. And so, so now I've got this medication. Well, one day I'm at where I work, and I'm walking across the street, and I see these two cars in the parking lot about to back out and hit each other. So I stop. And so this lady pulls up, and she honks a horn because I'm standing in the middle of the road in her way. And she's right there. And, of course, guess what? And I'm, but the nice thing is the cars didn't hit each other because she honks a horn. 
and I look at it and go, thank you. And I had to go back and work because now I'm, you know, so anything like that. And so it went on for a, it went on for a while. And I'm like, Lord, you know? And so I just was like, the word says, but you know what it made me do? It made me dig in. The word says, by Jesus' stripes we were healed. That's what the word says. But you know what, guys? You have to decide, do I just have the word here or do I have the word here? You know? I can say, guys, pray for me. That's okay. You get prayer. But there comes a time where you have to say, I'm standing. And I also had to look at, you know, mm, I'm going to be quiet on that one. Who do I surround myself with? Do the people believe like I do? Really? Or am I not surrounding myself with that? Charles and I dug in to watching people on TV that really were preaching it too. You know what I'm saying? And we dug in the word harder. I mean, I read the word a lot. But I spent my face on the ground interceding. And it not just for healing, but I'm hungry for the presence of God. I mean, I'm hungry to be in his presence because not only do I want healing, but I want to pray for other people. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? Okay. So, I changed heart daughters too. Okay. So, it, it, it's nothing like going out to your car and having a sister who loves jokes and you go out there to open your car door and there's a dead snake wrapped on your handle. That'll set you off. But not too, it's not been too long ago, has it, Nicole? We went out of the church and I was walking by the pastor's car and he'd forgotten his keys and when he went to turn it on, the horn went off. And it, right where I was standing and I screamed and jumped and we got in the car and what did you say to me? Do you remember? She looked at me and she went, you're not holding your heart. And I went, huh, I'm not holding my heart. I'm not holding my heart. I'm not hurting. That didn't set it off. Thank you, God. He's a good, good father. Amen. So it hadn't been happening. It hadn't been happening. It hadn't been happening. Okay? So it changes. But it takes some time sometimes. We want things overnight sometimes. But we have to keep putting the word in. We have to keep believing. You know? It takes time to get it where we put it from here to here. You know? And, and y'all, this year, we had some enemy attacks. Charles had a stroke in October. My mom was in the hospital at the exact same time with heart. And then my 45-year-old son had open heart, open heart surgery, three attacks, same year. But you know what? If I hadn't believed the word, I don't think any of them would have been here. And this is the year that COVID had you where you couldn't have people with you. So I'm like, Lord, I believe your word. Satan can't have them. Who are you going to believe and whose report are you going to believe? You know, I was going back and forth from this room, three doors down, this room, three doors down, this room. You can't have him. You can't have her. And my mom's 97. She's believing she's going to be here for the rapture. Hello, guys. It's going to be close. We're close. We're close. I'm, and his beeper went off. And this is what I'm going to end with. Charles and I have gotten serious about getting ready. We're digging in. My son in Atlanta called me, and he's got some serious stuff going on. I laid on the floor. And I'm not doing that to say. I'm just saying. It's time. You know, I've been reading about people being raised from the dead. One person, they laid on the ground for 12 hours to get their person back. How many of us would go, okay, I prayed a two-minute prayer. 
Uh uh. You want to see results. How many of y'all are willing to have all night prayer sessions to see results? You know? It's it takes more than just going, Well, God, I said a prayer. I'm I'm ready to see stuff happen. What about So instead of watching Hallmark every night, we've been turning on the different speakers and watching them and putting it in. And so there's some scriptures. Two of them are backwards, so just know we're not perfect, okay? But this is what Jesus, Mark 16, 15 through 18, so you have to look that one up. And Jesus' commission is still for us. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs, guys, will follow, okay, those who believe. All right, are y'all ready? In my name, they will cast out demons. Are you ready to do that? Okay. They will speak with new tongues. If you're not baptized in the Holy Spirit, you need to get yourself down here before you leave tonight. And they will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. My granddaughter got hold of some of my pills that should have wiped her out. It didn't. Okay? They will lay hands on the sick, and what will happen? They will recover. Amen. How many of y'all want to participate? All right. You can't be wishy-washy. You can't do it. You've got to give your all, not your part, but your all to him if you want to participate. It's got to be your whole heart. Your whole heart. Okay. There you go. That was good. Um, just sitting here, I felt like uh, somebody was like, I wish I could be up there and give my thing. So I'm going to give five minutes to whoever would like five minutes. Who is that person? I knew there was somebody. You got five minutes, Mr. Kurt. Preach, whatever you want to do. Good evening. Jeremy and myself, we've known each other for a couple of years, but this is the first time I met him. We're Facebook friends. We had posted on Cleve Walker, if anybody doesn't know who Cleve Walker is. He came back, said, I like that, and we just continued on there. He invited me to War Eagles when he set it up and everything. I go to a different church. I go to Solomon's Porch is our home church, and I know this was going on, and I know testimonies are outstanding because somebody needs to hear a testimony. My testimony is not how can I say, exciting or wonderful or adventurous or whatever like everybody else, but it's my testimony. Years ago, just over 50 years ago, I met this young girl. I had just gotten out of the army for a little while. We dated. Actually, our first date was so bad, I said I'm not, to myself, I'm not going to let her out again. Never. Right? We're never going out. She walked in the house, her dad asked, how was the date? And she says, terrible. And he says, that's going to be the man you marry. <laughs> this was on the 3rd of March. We were married the 27th of May, the same year. And we have been together for just over 50 years, and we're still learning things about each other. I joined the Army again, and I got out. I got tired of civilian life, said, I'm going back in. Well, we go to Massachusetts where her aunt and uncle lives. They go to Assembly of God Church. Requirements for staying with them until I could find a place for us was, you go to church. I was agnostic. I wasn't an atheist. I was an agnostic. Well, 
that was in October, February, the next year, I accepted the Lord as my Savior. And I heard a pastor say, this is a life-changing event, and it is. And if you don't remember where, where you were saved, are you really saved? You don't have to answer that question. But I remember it. In fact, uh, she was about 10 years ago, we went by the church again. Looks a lot different. Still a small church, but still assembly of God. Well, as Jeremy's mother said, you try to stay with the light people because if you don't, things start slipping away and you start backsliding, doing things you shouldn't do. You and I did. I backslid. But you know what? The Holy Spirit was always there whispering in my ear. Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? And since God gives us free will, you have the will to say, yes, I'm going to do it, or no, I'm not. So, did a lot of things I should have never done. I'm not going to go into the details, but they were messy. But I do remember one thing. We had went down to see her brother one time. He was in the Navy, and I was drinking with him and a friend of his, and his wife at the time was pregnant and had problems. So I had to take them to the hospital. Being the most sober person there, I drove. And from where they lived to the hospital was a good 20 miles. I remember getting to the hospital, and I remember one light on the way home. Why didn't I hit a car? Hit it, kill them, kill me, kill whatever. It was God. The Holy Spirit was there. The angel, and I know I put my guardian angel through a lot of problems, <laughs> right? Watching. And why are we here, though? Because God's not finished with us. We have a job to do that God has given us, and that's why we're still here. So... You might not think you have a calling, but that calling is there. You just have to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you on what God wants you to do. She came here and said, I'm not going to give my testimony. No way. But yet she got up because God said, get up and do it. Somebody needs to hear this, right? They might not think so, but... And it confirmed his that God and Walmarts can work together, right? I'm going to say a blue light special, but that's Kmart's, and since they don't have that anymore. So. But uh, my testimony, it's not as exciting or heart-pounding or, uh, how can I say, great, showing what the Lord can do. But you know what? My testimony is the Lord saved me. The Lord did not leave me in the Lord's blessing. God bless. You beat the five-minute mark. I only stopped my alarm. All right. Um, so to make it an even number seven, who would like to hear my testimony? Uh, if you all want to, yeah, I've, I've never really publicly told my testimony, so I'll give you the highlight reel, um, or we could save it for another night. We'll let majority decide here. You want to hear my testimony or y'all want to wait? Y'all want to go home? All right. Well, I can't give all of my testimony. Nobody here can because you'd have to literally be alive for the exact amount of time that you, we, we don't have 37 years. So I'll give you all the highlight reel. So um, my parents knew probably plug their ears because this might also, you know, but I got to tell it from my perspective. So uh, I was raised uh, Church of God. Y'all heard mom say dad was Catholic, mom was Methodist. So I was raised in a Church of God setting. Um, when I was five years old, I met my first demon. It was uh, literally, I met a demon, and it stood in my doorway for a year. And my parents bought these little music tapes and told me there was nothing there. And I saw it, and I knew it was there, and I felt it. It was there. There was a demon in my doorway. And it stood there, and it started from um, 
when, there, I don't know if y'all remember the show, not America's Funniest Home Videos, but America's Funniest People, uh, Dave Coulier would do this high waspish voice, and I wrote a book about all this, but only like five people have read it. Um, he would do this voice, and uh, there was this character portrayed as, it was like a jackalope. Does anybody here remember that? It would say, fast as fast can be, you'll never catch me. And it was an anti-hero, and it would go around like saving people, but it would do it in like terrible ways. And it was supposed to be like a, a joke. But I started seeing this thing in my room, but it was like pitch black, and it had like these shrouds of evil coming off of it. And it would just stand there, and it would just stare at me. And, it, you know, I'm five years old, and this thing's my height. I haven't grown much since then. But uh, it, it, my parents were from a spirit-filled background. They went to Norval Hayes School where demons manifested at their school. So they saw it all, but they weren't walking in the power. They, they had the gift of tongues and all that stuff, but they didn't really know how to cast out demons. You can see people casting out demons. You can see people healing, God using them for healing, but you're not walking in that manifested stuff yourself. And you go around saying, oh, I've seen, I've seen that before. It's like I could watch, I could watch um, what's, a, what's like uh, nip and tuck and be like, oh, yeah, I've seen that surgery, but I don't know how to do the surgery. So until you start walking in it. So long story short, uh, and the Lord just revealed this to me about seven, eight years ago, this was a spirit of fear. And it, some, somewhere along the lines, it entered inside of me. And I would manifest demons. I started sleepwalking. And uh, I, played, I was addicted to video games at a very young age. And uh, most video games are very demonic. And uh, I would manifest. I would black out, and I'd manifest, and I would attack my family. And I remember my, my, bro my brothers are eight and nine years older than me. And my brother, who's eight years older than me, Sean, he would... Uh, he, told, he described to me one time how he picked, picked me up and jacked me up against the wall, and he said it wasn't my brother I was looking at. So I, don't, I know none of this makes me sound great, uh, but recently, um, and that happened until like my uh, mid-teenage years, and I was a pretty good student in school. I got good grades. I was in gifted programs. And I, about uh, freshman, sophomore year, I tossed it all away for the party life because I went to church and I saw a bunch of religion. I, ha I hated church. I would fight them tooth and nail, and I would see people talking the talk and not walking the walk, and I got sick and tired of it. And I was like, these are nothing but a bunch of hypocrites. I don't see one real person at this church. And, you know, there were some real people there, but you justify your behavior. Um... So I started doing the party thing, smoking a lot of pot, being popular, and threw pretty much my education away, being a smart kid. And I was like, kind of bump this. I'm, I'm going to go after girls and learn how to play guitar and, <laughs> and, and just do the party thing. Because my oldest brother was, is, is very in intellectual, and I was kind of modeling him my younger years, and then I was like, uh, my other brother brings home a different girl every week. I'm going to be more like him. He was a rock star. He, played, he actually played a band. Um, so I modeled him. I, I just kind of switched idols, and I was like, I'm going to do that. And I started uh, smoking a lot of pot, drinking a lot, and, um, and the, all the time I would go to church. I would go to church, you know, and you think that going to church makes you a good person. It absolutely does not make you a good person. It makes, I, was, I was one of the biggest hypocrites. I, was, I became what I hated. Uh, I would actually take kids, I would, I would, and I would, dra I would t say, hey, let's go smoke pot or smoke some cigarettes and drag them out of church. And uh, we, uh, we had a little clique, little gang in the church, and we'd show up, oh, I think once or twice we showed up to the church high. Nobody's, nobody said anything or did anything. We would skateboard around the church. I was just a little, I got really into punk rock, and, uh, which that's heavily demonic, where it talks about anarchy and all kinds of stuff. I would go to like warp tours, and uh, I, just, I just thought it was the coolest thing, you know. And I learned if you treat women badly, they like you more, because when I was younger than that, I would open doors for women and, 
and and I got made fun of for for be, trying to be chivalrous. So I was like, you know what? If you treat them like dirt, they they they're all over you. And and it's there there's a lot of truth to that, but it's the wrong kind of women. Um so uh fast forward a little bit to uh I got baptized in the Holy Spirit as as a late teenager. It didn't really it kind of helped uh, I didn't have like an instantaneous transformation. Like I know some people, like Kurt was up here saying, I've heard this a lot. If you don't know the day you were saved, mine was more of a process. Uh, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues as a late teenager. Um, I'll tell you what really rocked my life is when God spoke to me for the first time. I was serving in church. I had been serving in church on and off. I was a, had a title, the servant of the church. Since like 2009, 2010, I got married to Chrissy. We got, we, I've known her since late 2007, early 2008. So we've been together for a long time. And, uh, but our first year of marriage was hell. You know, like we fought all the time. We were just two selfish people that were together. And, uh, you know, we were both like, how is this going to benefit me? You know, and I was, you know, that's how we are in the flesh. We're, we're selfish and and until 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 God changes us, until we start yielding to that process. So when I, I you know, I never pray, oh, when I got baptized in the Spirit, I never prayed in the Spirit. I prayed in the Spirit that one time I was baptized in the Spirit, and then I just didn't ever do it again. So as I was serving in church, I got, I started getting asked to be in the band. I was in the choir for a while, and I was, I, I was thinking like, man, my life is radically changing. But that was it. It was just like, you know, I would still kind of have a beer or two on the weekends. I was like, yeah, like, this is what Christianity is. You know, I, I used to, I was addicted to porn since I was like 12 years old. And I would, I would feel guilty every time I do it. And then I would get on my knees and I'd repent. And then I'd, I'd be like, okay, well, next time I'll go maybe a month before doing that again. But that's, th- let me tell you, that was my understanding of Christianity. That, because I, I, that's what I saw. You know, I, that, that's, that, that's what I saw from, like, everybody around me. And, and I'm not saying this to demonize anybody. I, I mean, this is, this is just kind of the way I was raised. I was, I was raised this way, and I'm not blaming my parents. I'm saying the church, everybody lived this way. I saw two-faced people all the time. And the Lord spoke to me. I remember, I remember it. I, now, this I remember. I remember the day I got written down my journal. I was, I was in the band, and I went from being in the youth band and I was, uh, to being uh, in the, the Celebrate Recovery band to uh, I actually got hand, foot, and mouth disease. And it's like impossibly rare to get hand, foot, and mouth disease as an adult. And I remember I couldn't play bass because I had blisters all over my fingers and my feet. And, I was, and I could, it was hard to walk. And I was like, what is happening to me? Like, nobody gets this. And uh, I, I took, uh, uh, well, Chrissy forced me to take like a uh, Tylenol PM. And I, I'm like against medicine. I'm like, I always say, would say like, I don't ever get sick hardly. And then I would never hardly get sick. And I didn't even realize there's power in the words that we say life and death is in the power of the tongue. But I, I wasn't, like, doing it. I was doing it more out of pride. You know, I wasn't doing it, like, because God said so or God told me. I, but I realized, like, there's, there is power in the things that we say in our attitudes and everything. But, the, you know, she, she kind of nagged me, like, take this medication. You're, you're in terrible pain. You're, you know, so I was like, all right, give me a Tylenol PM. I took it, and I ended up having a dream. And this was the fr- I, I felt led to do things, and I felt the presence of God before. And, you know, I would raise my hands and worship and feel the tinglys and all that stuff. But I'm talking like God audibly spoke to me. And I had this dream. And this was, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I, and, and, again, I've been serving in church at this point for, for a while. Um, but God, like, had an... Oh, before that, I remember hitting my knees... And, and, I don't know, weeks before, months before, I don't want to leave this part out, um, and I said, God, I'm tired of, of even having a beer on the weekends. Like, is, is this all Christianity is? I, I prayed something to that effect. And then, I don't know how long uh, amount of time had elapsed, but 
months later, weeks later, whatever it was, I had this dream. And it was, I was, saw an old-fashioned cast iron lantern. And this hand, just like this, started going towards the lantern. And it was like pitch black all around. If the lantern was lit, I did not notice much light coming off of it. And the hand just touches the lantern really gingerly. And <laughs> it illuminated. And after I woke up, not while I was sleeping, after I woke up, I heard and I felt God, and it was like he wrote words on, like, in my core, but I could hear it audibly, and he said, I lit a fire in you. And I went, whoa! And I remember it was probably one or two in the morning, and I woke up, and the presence of God was in the room, and I was like, what is happening? I don't, I've never felt anything like this before. And so I called Chrissy in the room, and Chrissy was raised Baptist. I was raised Church of God, so like I knew there were like prophets and stuff, but I was like, I'm never going to be one of those. It, and uh, I always, and, and, as a side note, I always thought Christians were also super boring, and I would never hang out. You know, there's an old song. It's like, I want to I wanna party with the sinners and pray with the saints. Like, that was kind of my philosophy, even though I didn't like that song, but that's the way I lived. Like, I was like, Christians are boring. I don't want to do anything with them. All they do is, what do they do? Like, they don't do anything. <laughs> and and I, it was just, I was just ignorant. Um, but I called Chrissy into the room. I was like, Chrissy, get in here. And she runs in the room. And I'm like, I just heard God. And she, her eyes went like saucers. She was like, what was in this medicine? <laughs> I, I, I'm, but the thing is, she didn't say it out loud. And I could read her. It was like I read her thoughts. And not just because of her, her body language or anything. I was just like, I knew right away, like, oh, man. Like, she is freaked out right now, and it was like, uh, so, the, I was, I had to get her, I'd, I sat there for like 10 minutes trying to convince her, like, no, I heard God, you don't understand, I heard God, and, and I could tell, like, she was like, okay, okay, like, like, you heard God, whatever, and the next, like, six months, our marriage was worse off than when it started, because she had written me off like, you turned into a crazy person. Every time I went to church, I was like hearing people's thoughts. Re they, now I know it's called reading your, their mail. And I was like, that guy's got a demon. What are they doing in church? <laughs> I, I would walk around like, I, I, this guy would walk past me and I would hear, I hate that guy. And I was like, he hates me? God bless him. Why does he hate me? And, 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 like, just everybody, every, like, this guy thinks I'm a weirdo. Like, this guy thinks whatever. This guy's thinking about porn. This guy's got a spirit of lust on him. What, what, th this is the church I'm going to? And I started, the Lord started giving me messages for my leadership. And I would deliver them to him. And then I started realizing they don't want these messages. They don't want to hear what the Lord has to say about their church. Because they're comfortable being on their cruise ships. I was like, this isn't the way it's supposed to be at all. I started devouring the word like never before. I started researching end times events. Everybody thought I lost my mind. The Lord started telling me, I am coming soon. I am coming soon. One time he woke me up in the middle of the night. It was, three, it was about 2 or 3 in the morning. And the Holy Spirit was in the room. And I could see this like portal above my bed. And I was like, what is happening? And I felt this peace and this power flooding me, flooding my entire body. And he said, are you ready? I said, uh, I don't know, Lord. And, and he didn't respond, but I felt peace wash over me again. Like he liked my answer. And I was just, I was blown away like the God of the universe is in my room. What do you want with me? I've heard him say, I am coming soon for like the past five years on repeat, and it's been getting louder and faster. And I'm not saying this. To, the Lord has spoken to me. I've got a journal with like 500 pages filled with stuff that he has direct words or indirect words from the Lord, visions he's shown me, things that he's shown me, and and and. Let me tell you, the persecution has been real. And it's not coming as much from the, the world. It's coming from the church for me. 
Why? But then you read the Bible and you look, oh, Jesus, the Old Testament prophets, they all went through the same thing I'm going through. And I'm looking around going, is it just me? Is it just me? And it's just been this past like two or three years, he's like, he started showing me. He told me, my ministry, he said, your ministry, you're going to be ministering to church hurt people just like you. We were not made for this world. This world is ugly and dark, and it's fallen. God's got a new heaven and a new earth for us. This is not crazy person talk. This is what the Word of God tells us. What you saw up here tonight is a taste of what's coming. Just a tiny taste. He, while, we, while I was listening to testimonies, Kyle, he showed me we're going to be doing the same thing in that tent and watching people get up, legs, limbs regrow, legs regrow. And it's going to be like, what is happening? Like the, the crazy ones are going to be like, what is happening? I'm not the only one in this room that has been called a wolf. I'm not the only one in this room that has said, that guy's got demons. No, you just don't want your demons to get exposed. There's a reason they don't like us. If you're walking in what God's got for you, there are different levels of surrender. When you walk in the fullness of God... The religious were Jesus' number one enemy too. As annoying as they are, let them be annoying. Pray for them. I bless them. Bless those that curse you. I'll tell you a quick story. I had a problem guy at work. He was the most arrogant dude I've ever, well, one, not the most. He was very arrogant. And, I mean, every day he gave me problems. I think he was a Freemason. He was a wrestler. He was just like, I can beat up anybody, you know. And he was just like, I don't, I was like one of the trainers at my workplace. And he was like, I don't want to learn from you. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to teach you. <laughs> but they kind of put us in a close, you know, proximity to each other, uh, so it was, it was a test for me. And the Lord one day, after like six months of this nonsense going on, he would like boss me around, even though I was supposed to be his superior, he would be like, come bring me this auger, come bring me this tool, come drop it off at my place, and I'd be like, let's meet halfway. Let's, you know, let's meet halfway. No, 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 I've, I'm busier than you, so you have to come to me. I'm like, I got four kids. But anyway... I did, I did. I just did what he said. The Lord is like, just do it. And I would, I would just do it, even though I'd be kind of angry. I would bite my tongue all the time. And one day the Lord said, he spoke to me and he said, why don't you pray for him? I was like, ah, I don't want to do that. I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy, Lord. And he said, not just pray for him. I want you to bless him. And I was like, no, because then you're going to do it. <laughs> you're going to bless him. If, if I pray bless him, you're going to bless him. I know you, God. You're going to bless this guy. I don't want him to be blessed. But I was like, ah. it didn't take me long. It was like 30 seconds of a rant. And I was like, God, and I just sincerely prayed for him. I blessed him. It was like three days later, this guy left. He got blessed. He got blessed away. And I was like, I was like, I, it was like a revelation for me. I was like, I didn't do it for that intention or to be selfish. Like, I really just blessed him. I was like, I mean, I, mean, I was just mind blown. Like, I should have been blessing people forever. I should have been blessing people since I was a kid. I don't care if he's making a million dollars somewhere. 
He's, he's, he's not my problem anymore. I gave it over to God. I gave it over to God. I gave it over to God. Because when I tried to control it, it went badly. But when he is in control, ain't nothing bad about it. There's some people in this room that need to surrender. I could surrender more. But specifically, there's some people in this room. They're like, what is, uh, I'm getting it now. What does that look like? Uh, surrender. I am surrendered. If that's your attitude, you're not. I'm sorry. Because I'm not fully surrendered. Only Jesus walked it out 100%. Only Jesus walked it out 100%. There's a big difference between sin, transgression, and iniquity. Sin simply means to miss the mark. Transgression is knowing it's wrong. It's trespassing and doing it in any way. Iniquity is bondage and addiction. So there's different levels. People, the, the good church folk, are all in sin. Some of them are worse off than that. But then we're judging, at least I don't do meth. That's all I used to think. At least I don't do heroin. I'm just smoking pot. I'm not doing heroin. No, I'm no better than that person doing heroin. No better. What about lying? I'm not lying right now. A testimony is exposing your past to give glory to God. I've seen so many people give testimonies. I'm not saying about anybody tonight. Everybody was great, but I've... I've literally heard testimonies where it's like, man, I did this, and I did that, and I did this, and did that, and did this, and did that, and then I got, I uh, almost died this one time. Oh, yeah, praise God. And I did this, and I did that, and I'm like, I'm like, this has nothing to do with God. Like, you're just like, it's God's an afterthought to you. I'm ready for more. I am searching for people, and it's not me. The Lord is searching for people who are fed up with complacency. Just as Pastor Kyle was preaching this morning. We need to be fed up. Because it's the wrong spirit to go, man, there's, man, this world just sucks. This country is just going to hell. And man, it, this, this city is disgusta. No, like that's a, like, well, I'm, I'm going to pray for, yeah, you need to get right. You need to get Jesus. No, buddy, you need to get Jesus. There's a shirt that says, y'all need Jesus. I don't like that shirt. All need Jesus. You can take that Y right out. All need Jesus. Without him, we are scum. I'm not trying to sound, go full Baptist right now, but without him, we are dirt. We are less than dirt. We are dust. But in him, here's the but, the balance. Without him, nothing, nothing, nothing. In him, all things. That's when we walk in the spirit. There are two people here go, I want, going right now, I want some of what that guy's talking about. Two people. God, I see his finger stirring your spirit. You can have that. You can't have Pentecost without paying the cost. If you're brave enough to step out and receive that, it's open. There's no official altar here, but you can still get altered. Are you brave enough? Pastor Kyle, can I invite you back up to the front, please? There's one more. I'm going to wait. What this means isn't just a new level. It means greater surrender.
I know you, you're one that counts the cost, you know what that means. But the Lord's been speaking to you as I've been speaking the whole time. The whole time. Thank you, Lord. Might have to have you sit. You're too tall for me to lay hands on you. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. We're probably going to go ahead and end the live here, too. God bless you guys. A lot of times the real stuff happens when the camera's cut off.